Foundations of Health, Part 1. Today we're going to talk about the basic principles of natural hygiene. So let's talk about health, and if you're anything like the guy in the picture there, there's a good chance you've become completely overwhelmed by the amount of health information that's available to you. As a health seeker, I'm sure you've read countless magazines, books, internet articles, and the list goes on and on. And I'm sure you've quickly realized that this information often conflicts and that everyone seemingly has a different opinion on the subject. There are hundreds if not thousands of diet books out there, for example, and each one has you doing something completely different. If you're like the average person, you've tried all kinds of approaches to healing without any significant results. And where does that leave you? Well, probably confused, frustrated, and wanting to pull your hair out like the guy in that picture there. So, what we're in need of is a strong foundation. We need a framework, some basic principles to begin to make sense of the information around us, to think for ourselves, and ultimately be able to distinguish good information from bad information. We need a system to identify truth, complete with guiding principles that will ultimately allow us to achieve health freedom and independence. Now this is where natural hygiene really steps in. Now, natural hygiene is a term that I'm sure the vast majority of you are unfamiliar with. So let's get a quick definition so that when I use that term throughout this presentation, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So then what is natural hygiene? Now this definition was created by one of the original hygienists, Dr. Herbert Shelton. You can see his picture there in the upper left hand corner. And he defined hygiene as that branch of biology which designates the conditions upon which health depends and the means by which it may be sustained in all its virtue and purity while we have it, and the means upon which its restoration rests when we have lost it. It is the scientific application of the principles of nature in the preservation and restoration of health. Hygienic means health preserving. Practically, it implies the observance of the laws of life. And natural hygiene ultimately teaches that man is the builder of his own diseases, and that disease does not come upon them without causes. Now that was a, a mouthful, I know. So let's break it down piece by piece so we can truly understand what Dr. Shelton was talking about. So let's begin building our foundation uh, by talking about the causes of health and the causes of disease. And in doing so, our discussion has to begin with a concept of energy. What I'd like you guys to do is to picture your body having its very own battery pack. And your battery is filled with what's called vital energy, which can also be called innate energy, or life force, uh, they, they all essentially mean the same thing. So let's take a look at this green battery we've got to the left on the screen. This battery represents your daily supply of vital energy. It's the source from which your body derives its power to complete all its daily activities, both conscious and unconscious. Conscious activities may include reading, running, studying, and gardening, for example while unconscious activities may include digestion, heartbeat, breathing, and other cellular processes that you may not be aware of. Each and every process that your body undergoes requires a specific amount of this vital power, and it will drain your battery pack in a proportionate manner. But after a full night's sleep, your battery pack will be completely recharged as shown by the green battery to the left. Throughout the day, however, as energy is continuously being used up and drained, as shown by the red battery on the right, your body will then begin to signal you with a warning which we call fatigue. This happens as your battery starts to reach low power. And this fatigue is telling you that it is once again time to go to sleep and recharge. Now a full night's sleep will provide you with full vitality for the next day, but sleeping only 50% of what is required will leave you with only 50% vitality for the next day. And here's a picture of a little girl who ran out of battery power or vital energy after playing and run around, running around and she just decided to pass out right there on, in that cupboard there. Here's your take home point. There must be a balance between energy expended and energy produced. In other words, if we expend more than we produce, we will quickly end up in energy debt, leaving the body shorthanded and with no choice but to tap into its reserve storage supply. The human body is tremendous energy reserve, given to you by nature for emergency situations. And our reserves will keep us awake and functioning at a high level for days if necessary, especially if we're confronted with survival situations. But routinely tapping into the savings tank 
will eventually lead to complete exhaustion. And when completely empty, that's theoretically when, when death would ensue. Now, there are two bodily departments, so to speak, that demand the highest quantity of this vital power. Remember, everything your body does requires energy, but the following departments require the most on a daily basis, so we're going to keep our conversation focused here. Now, these are the Department of Food Processing, most notably Digestion, and the Department of Sanitation, or Waste Removal. The majority of our vitality supplies these two departments. Let's take a look at food processing, for example, to illustrate this point. Picture yourself at home with family on Thanksgiving, and food fills the table, and each person eats as if it were the last time they're going to for a month, right? Now, after each person has done stuffing his face with turkey, gravy, corn, potatoes, and stuffing, what then is the inevitable next step? And I'm sure you can guess. A good long nap, right? Because it takes literally all the body's vital energy to begin processing and digesting all that food that we just forced down our throats. Now, this is what is commonly referred to as being in a food coma or being drunk on food when so much of the body's blood flow and vitality are needed in the intestinal tract that there's not much left over for anything else. All right, so let's get back to this concept of energy. Now, when the battery pack is low and we're in a state of energy debt, when we're expending more energy than when we're producing, we're in a state of what we like to call innervation or energy debt or exhaustion. Now, when we're in energy debt, the two departments that suffer the most are the two that require the most energy, right? The, food, the Department of Food Processing and the Departments of Sanitation. There simply isn't enough energy dollars, so to speak, to fund uh, activities within these departments, and so their function begins to suffer. Now, as the Department of Sanitation lacks energy, the amount of waste, both exogenous, outside-in waste, and endogenous, intrinsic or metabolic waste, these begin to accumulate. Now let's take a look at the chart on the screen. And on the vertical scale, we have waste or toxins. And on the horizontal or x-axis, we have time. The horizontal line in the middle is a threshold point. If the amount of waste is kept below the threshold point, right, if the Department of Sanitation has plenty of energy and can process waste quickly, right, the body views this as a manageable situation. There isn't enough waste floating around to, to cause organic damage to the cells and tissues, and the body remains in a good state of function and a good state of health. But if the amount of waste exceeds the threshold point, we enter, yes, that's right, the danger zone. At this point, damage to cells and tissues is occurring, and the body is faced with a choice. Now, the body has two choices, right? It can either allow the level of waste to damage the system, ultimately ending in death, or it can take action to reduce the level of waste. Now the body is a tremendously intelligent machine and will at all costs do what's necessary for survival. So choice one then is out of the question. So choice two is ultimately your body's, uh, your, your body's number one choice there. Now once the level of waste exceeds the threshold point, right, because we're in energy debt and the Department of Sanitation doesn't have enough energy to fund its functions, the body then creates what is called a crisis of toxemia, right? That was the body's decision to take action. A crisis of toxemia is a body-instituted action aimed at reducing the level of waste back down to a manageable level, back down below the threshold point. This crisis comes in the form of an acute illness, uh, say a cold or the flu, for example. Now, the symptoms of a cold or flu, coughing, sneezing, diarrhea, vomiting, sweating, fever, skin lesions, uh, all represent heightened effort, efforts at elimination. Each of those symptoms is an avenue by which the body quickly gets rid of waste, whether it be through the mouth, the GI tract, the skin, or the lungs. Now, as you quickly continue, or as you continue to cough up waste, break out an acne or a rash, experience diarrhea, vomiting, for example, there eventually comes a point at which the level of waste will drop back down below the threshold point into the manageable range. At this point, the body's work is complete, the danger has been averted, and the sickness or the crisis ends as quickly as if turning off a faucet. 
However, when we come down with an acute illness, it's all too common to visit, yes, I'm sure you guessed it, the doctor. And the doctor conveniently provides us with, yeah, I'm sure you guessed it again, drugs and other symptom suppressing treatments. Now remember, the symptom represents vital action or body instituted action to eliminate waste quickly in order to bring levels, waste levels back down to manageable range. The illness is created by the body. If we suppress the symptoms with drugs and other treatments and the body cannot quickly eliminate the excess waste, then what happened to all that waste? And I'm sure you guessed it again, it gets trapped inside the body. You see, the crisis or illness is the body's cure. To treat the symptom is to try to eliminate the cure. And so essentially, your doctor is trying to cure the cure. Now this clearly makes little sense. Now, when uh, we take uh, drugs and other symptom suppressing uh, treatments, the garbage gets, or the waste gets trapped inside the body and it really starts to pile up. And yeah, we're still caught in the danger zone where damage is now beginning to occur. Now this damage now manifests in what we call a chronic disease. And chronic disease is no longer a body instituted process aimed at quickly removing toxins, but rather represents the manifestation of actual organic damage. And there you have it, we have red hot rheumatic joints, psoriasis, lupus and other skin lesions, inflammatory bowel diseases, and other autoimmune diseases, uh, you name it. And at the very end stage of this process, when the cells are completely bathed in waste and toxic matter, and begin to, they begin to mutate, and they no longer replicate in the proper manner. This then, the very end stage of disease, is what we call cancer. Now the name of the chronic disease is irrelevant. The diagnosis is really only a name for a collection of symptoms. And now you and I are smarter than that, right? We know that if we're, we're going to address an effect, we must first identify and address its cause. You can't stop your hand from burning on a hot stove if you first don't remove your hand, right? To try to suppress a disease or cure it without removing its cause is akin to treating a burning hand without taking it off the stove or out of the fire, or better yet, trying to cure a drunk while he continues to drink. So, what then are the fundamental causes of disease? And as I'm sure you now know, uh, innervation or being in a state of energy debt and toxemia or a buildup of energy debt, the Department of Sanitation suffers. And when the department suffers, garbage accumulates. When garbage accumulates and exceeds the body's threshold point, the body creates a sickness to quickly eliminate waste and bring it back down to safe levels. If we allow the body to do its work, the level of waste will quickly drop and the body will once again return to normal function. The danger will be averted and better health will result. But if we interfere with the body's work and choose to place trust in symptom suppressing treatments rather than the body's innate healing powers, then we are headed down a road that leads to nothing but sickness and suffering. So now that we understand the fundamental causes of disease, how can we begin to address them? Well, let's begin to identify the more common ways in which we continually innervate or exhaust the body's vitality. Remember, this is the number one cause of disease. Now, a lack of sleep is the surest way to end up in energy debt. If you don't sleep, you won't produce any vital energy in the first place. Stress, emotional and mental, also greatly fatigues the body. Have you ever been completely overwhelmed by fear, anger, or anxiety only to find yourself completely exhausted once the crisis was resolved? This is because it takes a tremendous amount of vitality to deal with these kind of stresses. Overeating is another common cause of innervation. Remember, it takes a tremendous amount of vitality to process food. It was number one on our list as far as energy demands go. When we continuously put food into the system unnecessarily, our body's energy resources quickly become depleted and then, as a result, the Department of Sanitation will begin to suffer as a result of uh, energy debt. Exercise itself requires a lot of energy. Over-exercising is another common cause of innervation, um, but highly misunderstood. Exercise is a catabolic process, which means it breaks the body down. 
Healing and recovery is also energy expensive, further depleting the system. Now, I'm not saying exercise is bad for you, but what I am saying is that we must first be sure that we have the energy to perform it in the first place and be very careful not to push ourselves to the brink and overdo it. Let's look at some of the more common causes of the second cause of disease, uh, toxemia or a buildup of waste. Now, the body is continuously producing metabolic waste, so that's a given. Let's instead focus on the ways in which we consciously poison ourselves from outside in. Now, these may include pesticides, polluted air, polluted water, chemicals, uh, food additives, alcohol and tobacco, prescription and over-the-counter medications, poor food choices, caffeine, vaccines, radiation, just to name a few. Now, remember, the body deals with waste all the time. We, um, we run into trouble when the amount of waste exceeds the rate at which the body can process and remove it. Now, the process requires abundant energy, which is why the single biggest cause of toxemia, other than outright poisoning, of course, is being in a state of innervation or exhaustion. Now that you understand the basic causes of disease, go ahead and make your own list. Identify the ways in which you unnecessarily waste your vital energy or not produce it in the first place and continuously burden the system with added waste or toxic products. Do your best to identify and address these causes and see what you can do to eliminate them. Alright, so let's head back to our definition of natural hygiene and take a look at the second half of the story, creating the proper conditions for healing to occur. Once the causes of disease have been identified and addressed, we must then work to provide the proper environment for the body to most effectively heal itself. Let's make use of a simple analogy to demonstrate this point. Here we have a nice picture of a garden someone constructed in their yard. We've got a few rows of plants here in a nice sized plot. Now if we want our garden to thrive and our plants to be strong and healthy, we must provide the proper conditions for that to occur. Each plant species uh, that we have in our garden will thrive under a specific set of conditions. Each must have the proper soil nutrition, the proper amount of sunlight, um, the proper amount of care and attention, the proper temperature for example, and the proper protection of course. The amounts of each will vary according to the type of the plant and we must do our best to identify and apply each in the right amount. If we fail to provide the proper conditions, our plants and our garden will begin to wilt and die. Now this concept applies not only to the plants of this world, but to all organisms for that matter. Plants, dogs, and people for example, each thrive under a specific set of ideal conditions. So here's the take home point. The human body, and all organisms on this planet for that matter, are self-healing and self-regulating, but, now for the fine print, only under the right conditions. So back to our definition of uh, natural hygiene, and our natural hygiene seeks to understand and address the causes of disease, and then apply the conditions of health in order to preserve health when we have it and restore health when we have lost it. Those influences that have a positive effect on the human body include pure air, pure water, whole predominantly raw foods, sunlight exposure, good and good social influences, proper exercise in the right amount, companionship and love, emotional poise and peace, and I'm sure you can think of more, the list goes on and on. And when the proper conditions for health are provided at the right time and in the right amount, the body's innate healing potential will then become a reality. In taking a hygienic approach to health, we must first identify the causes of disease, address them, and then provide the optimal conditions for health. Keep in mind, though, that we are all different. Each one of us is extraordinarily unique, and it's not enough to merely assign a diagnosis and treat everyone as if they were the same. We're all individuals from a genetic standpoint, a biochemical standpoint, and an environmental standpoint. Each one of us has needs all our own. The causes of disease are different for different people, even if they have been given the same diagnosis. We must work to apply the hygienic principles we learned today in a way that takes this individuality into account. At the clinic, for example, we routinely see patients with rheumatoid arthritis, 
and I'm amazed at how different and unique each case is from the next. And this applies to almost any condition for that matter. It is essential to find a practitioner that will take the time necessary to identify the unique causes of a particular health impairment, not by focusing on the diagnosis per se, but rather by taking a thorough history, a physical exam, and by ordering functional and standard laboratory testing as needed. Causes identified, causes addressed, health restored. We do not offer treatments for disease, but instead work to bring out the healing powers within, creating an individualized program suited to your needs, aimed at addressing the causes of impairment and creating the right conditions for your body to then begin the healing process. What's good for one person is not always good for another. We appreciate the uniqueness of your situation and work diligently towards putting you on the path to restored health.